So, this is it. Life. What is it? What's it all about? Is it about who can eat the most cheeseburgers? Drink the most beer? Buy the most stuff? Is that it? Is that all there is? My culture tells me to believe it is. That it's all about being a consumer. The more you buy, the more you forget that you will die. That's right. There it is, staring you in the face. And what do you do about it? I fill journal after journal after journal with wonderings and ponderings. Who am I? Why am I here? What's it all about? Then what do I do? I ride my bike and ride and ride, and then skate and skate until I can't go any further, trying to escape, avoid, ignore the fact that there isn't an answer. Sometimes, always, I wish I didn't feel so alone in this. I wish I could know that you feel the way I do sometimes. But what can you do about it in the end anyway? Go on a killing spree? Hmm, might sound good at times. Uh, what did I do? Well, I decided to join a band. That's right, I'm on a quest to find the meaning of life in the St. Louis Arts and Entertainment Underground. I thought I would try asking a bunch of people I know if they knew what it all meant. Answers, um, varied. What is the meaning of life? <laughs> <laughs> I have no clue. <laughs> there were some good ones too, but I'll save those for later. For now, let's take a look at not just what is going on in the underground, but why artists, musicians, entertainers, and promoters do what they do in the underground scene, that world on the fringe. No, not the underworld of crime, silly. Underground arts and music and stuff, you know, kind of outside the mainstream. People who are doing what they do because they love it, not just for money. So here we go. Sit back and stretch your mind because this program will stretch your perception of what it's all about. I actually started painting in 1989, so that would be 15 years or thereabouts. And it's fun working uh, on stuff in restaurants and bars because people come over and take a look and uh, a lot of them end up being customers. and. Uh, friends or both, there's no uh, distinction. It's not either or friends or customers. It's, it's the same thing really. Uh, a lot of people, they go to work and then uh, that's one segment compartment of their life. And then after, then they do whatever it is that gives them pleasure. And uh, you know, I feel really lucky because I can combine, I can work and have fun at the same time. And uh, sometimes it's too much fun though. You know, everybody has some idea about whether there's a uh, life after death or not. Uh, and everybody knows, some people absolutely know it's Jesus or Satan, heaven or in hell. I kind of lean towards thinking that once we die, our individual personality is just gone. And, and you know, I have friends that believe in reincarnation and this and that, and that's fine, but I don't know anything about what's gonna happen after I die. So just in case, I wanna leave a lot of great stuff behind. I thought I might call it Mangia Evoluciano because it's evolution and time and space, matter, energy, light, gravity, all that junk. Imagine atoms and molecules all the way up to stars and galaxies. And then here we are somewhere in between all that stuff and a part of all that, the stuff that uh, makes up our physical material. It's recycled material from exploded stars billions of years ago and all that kind of stuff. We preserved the mural because uh, it's such an integral part of what the restaurant was before my partners and I came here. I, I adore it. I think it's awesome. I think it's absolutely amazing that he's worked for this long on this mural. And, you know, he doesn't receive any monetary compensation for this. You know, we, we feed him whatever he wants here at the restaurant, but it's impossible, you know, several times a day. I wish that I could be that happy with that few needs in life. Wayne's artwork is very inspirational for me. I paint too, but he's a very free style. You know, there are no boundaries, no limitations. Anything goes, and I think that's what attracts me most to it. It's like being in a dream. I guess that's the way I can explain it. It's like there's, he's in between worlds, sort of say. There's always something going on in his mind. It kind of consumes him and Wayne lives through his work. 
through his paintings, gives inspiration to other people. He does what he wants to do, not what people are telling him to do. I love Wayne's artwork. I think, like him, it's uh, colorful, eccentric. Every time you talk with him or see his artwork, you find out something new. Uh, every inch of it tells a different story. Um, and I feel sorry for anyone who sees his artwork or meets him and is not inspired because it exudes positive energy. So uh, one day I was sitting there drawing with him and, uh, and uh, he said, want to try some colors? I was like, yeah, you know? And it was my first time ever dabbling with paint. I ended up doing this painting. This one is uh, Wayne from 1977, back when he was Buddy Frankenstein. I had a dream back around the same time that I was uh, hanging out at Wayne's house all the time, and it was Miles Davis was in the dream, and I was having this conversation with Miles Davis. And, uh, and I remember Miles Davis said to me in the dream, he said, creativity is man's way of getting over it. And it is capitalized I-T, meaning uh, whatever, whatever you're going through in life, uh, it, you know. And so, so I, I see art as a way of like tackling these problems in, in, in life and in, in society. I see artists' role in society as uh, an answer to, to the vulgarities of life uh, with beauty. I always imagine the, even years from now, people looking at my stuff, whether it's in a restaurant or in somebody's living room, and you know, it might be some stormy night and there'd be a few people sitting around having some wine and discussing, you know, great works of world-class genius or whatever. And, oh, by the way, here's some of Wayne's stuff on the wall. And then famous old stories will come up. Because I always enjoy listening to stories about other people, whether it's Gaslight Square or, you know, the Roaring Twenties or whatever it might be. While I'm working, I can daydream and fantasize about uh, where this piece is going and who's going to see it. And, uh, you know, this mural, a lot of times there'll be families in for dinner and uh, parents with their little kids and the kids will go up and down and look at different things and maybe one of those kids is going to kind of get that spark in his or her brain. A couple times when uh, a kid will come over and I'll say, hey, uh, try this at home when mommy and daddy are asleep. And uh, I probably shouldn't do that. but. Uh, <laughs> Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Dangerous Curves. I'm Sherry Danger. I'm going to be your host for the next two hours. That's two hours of music by female artists, all genres, blues, jazz, pop, rock, 50,000 watts of femininity. You're hearing it only on 88.1 KDHX, St. Louis Community Radio. I know having my show, a show that focuses on females, gives people a lot more awareness of the music that women create. A lot of shows have a tendency to do like one or two cuts by women, not be, be very conscious of the female artists that are out there recording. And I think so many women artists are just bypassed because it's just, their names aren't known. They just don't get the airplay and therefore they aren't known, then they don't get played and it's just a cycle. So having the show allows me to expose the female artists that are out there and doing, and doing just as good. For me, it's so important not just to play the new artists and the emerging artists and, and the artists saying the trends now, but to, to go back a generation, another generation, go back to the Bessie Smiths, go back to the Ma Rainey's, go back to the early blues artists that went out when women weren't on the road touring and playing, that went out and played and played the same shows and went on the road, raised a family and did all this stuff and really defined what women could do in music. And then you see that reflected in the artists today that actually go out and make the music and set their own road. So it's all about celebrating the women and the strength in the women that make the music. wonderful and empowering to hear all these different styles of music across many decades. All very strong women that don't get enough recognition. Well, and Short's just pretty inspiring. I, I know that she does a lot of research. Um, she spends a lot of her own finances on the record collection that she has. Um, she's, always, she's always digging deeper, trying to find unheard things. I mean, that's really, that's just very special, and she's very devoted. The five, six, seven, eights, and Bond Girl. Up next, one by the Pebbles. Sherry is one of the most amazing bar owners. All nights 
of the week, she pretty much reserves for local groups. Occasionally we'll have a traveling act come through, but any local group will be given a chance, and a fair chance, and she supports women amazingly. The WOW Fest was a festival put together by Sherry and a bunch of lady rockers down on the south side. It stood for Way Out Women, and uh, we just wanted to have a response to Lollapalooza and all the male-dominated kind of things. All proceeds went to a good cause of some sort. Um, we sponsored a kid to go to entrepreneurial camp, and then also May, we gave Mae Wheeler uh, some money for her scholarship fund for musicians. Uh, the Way Out Club. And I remember when we started back in 94, we wanted a club that would have music and would have poetry. It would just be a, well, our concept, your home away from home. This came from Bob, because Bob had been in the music scene a lot longer than me. But his idea was that he saw so many great bands from out of town, and the local music was just used to, like, an add-on. But it was a local music that was really creating the scene and keeping the music alive in St. Louis and supporting so many out-of-town bands. So when we opened the club, our thought was, why not highlight the local music? It's great. You know, we have a lot of really talented people in town, and they really deserve a place to play, and not just as an opening act for, for other people, but in their own right and, and with the respect that the music they create deserves. So that was the concept of opening up the Way Out Club. This is just one of those little roads, side roads, that life took me on. And, and now I'm owning a club, and now I'm doing a women's music show. And I guess the thing that drives me is I'm actually doing things I enjoy. I'm investing the time in something I like. And the rewards, are they feel just so much greater. I'm not punching anybody else's clock. I'm just kind of setting my own time, setting my own pace. And the music's a great exploration also with the club. It's, it's like a party every night, and I'm meeting new people every week. It's, it's the best job in the world. <laughs> Kudos to Bob and Sherry. Kudos to Sherry Danger in particular for Dangerous Curves. Hooray for KDHX, which I, I do think is the, possibly the best radio station in the United States. And uh, yeah, good for St. Louis. They're, it's like a hidden reserve of gold. No one knows it's quite there yet, but it, it exists, and it's it's super special. It's amazing. I've been following Mark from so long, from his uh, surf garage days since the Boo Rays. You know, through the Highway Matrons, to Fred's Variety Group. And it's amazing how he encompasses so many feelings of life, you know, from the downside of life to the upside and everything in between. And he takes an amazing perspective on all sorts of life, you know, from his own sideline to what other people's perspectives are. And I love the way he melds them all together. When I first saw the Highway Matrons, I uh, thought Mark Martians had a million dollar voice. It was a voice that bore the history of his heart and of his habits, you know, whatever those might be. There are some bands that come along that make everyone else seem like a cliche, and I thought the Highway Matrons were certainly, certainly one of those bands that make null and void much of what you've been listening to. And, I just thought they were wonderful. I saw them four years ago. That was the day I got my first guitar. I watched them play at the Way Out Club, and I had never seen such use of the distortion pedal or beautiful vocals and things like that. And I vowed that one day I'd be doing the same thing. And not imitating, but just inspired by. Myself and some friends in town used to be uh, in a band, and, uh, and we sort of met Mark through that, through the, the way the way you usually meet people in that kind of situation. And uh, and we asked them, along with uh, about I guess a total of about 20 other bands, to be involved in these trading cards that we did as a kind of a scene builder, I guess is the best way to say it. And, uh, and yeah, and luckily luckily they did it along with the other bands, and uh, I think we had a, ended up with a pretty pretty cool set of things, you know. Then. We belong even more underground than the underground. We should be buried even deeper, I think. I like a uh, pickup truck that we don't do anymore. I really like Cobalt Waltz. 
I think he put a lot of time and effort into that. But mostly I like the ones that I wrote, because I can kind of tell easier where we're going with them. I really just just love music. I mean, I have like thousands and thousands of records. I've just been a huge music fan since I heard pop radio in 1974, and I, that's what I guess what I wanted to do when I was in one of the last version of the Boo Rays. And uh, one night I was on stage and feeling like really stupid to be up there, you know. And it was at a college gig, and nobody was really paying any attention. In the midst of that show, I got over my stage fright for good because I figured otherwise I'd just be at a bar trying to talk to some people or some girl. And that this way, I had what I was going to say all planned out in a song, and I had an amplifier and a microphone. So I felt like it was a great privilege, and I always feel that way. My friend Mickey, who has like an 11-year-old son who's apt to get in a lot of trouble, he's been trying to steer him towards music because his theory is that, because he quit music and got in all kinds of trouble when he was a little older than his son, so his theory is if you have that, then you're not going to be bored at least, and you're also going to have like a means, which people don't allow themselves very many means of public expression with strangers, I guess, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's a channeling of desires that could otherwise cause you trouble socially, I guess. And it's a form of communication where verbal communication lacks. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I'd like, the frankest answer to why I play music is because, in some ways, life is very mundane. No matter what you do, people get into a rut, and I think music is a way to elevate yourself, at least mentally, from the rut. It's productive to like make money and raise a family, but I think everybody you know, has not really necessarily goals beyond that, but the understanding that, that other things exist past that. Maybe it's a way to exercise that, give the rest of it some purpose, too. creating artwork probably as long as I can remember. It's probably the one thing that I know I'm good at. So <laughs> I can't not draw or create or sculpt or make things. Yeah, I absolutely have to do it or else I'll go crazy. I really like tattoos. I think it's a really uh, interesting art form. You're putting something on somebody for life. And skin is just a really weird thing to, to deal with. Everybody's different, so it's always a challenge. It's definitely always a challenge. If someone wants something really large, it's a long process. I'll make a couple of sketches of, of whatever they want. I'll trace out the area that they're getting their tattoo and um, then I'll have them come back a few times to look at the drawings and see if they want any changes made. And, and if it's something large and it's gonna take three or four or five sittings, then they'll come back over a few months and we'll start with an outline and then start coloring it in over a few months time. Once this is on, I could just tattoo right over it, pretty much. There! That's a good little foot. Aww. Okay. Well, she got six toes. Okay, we're all done with the stencil. Are you ready? Yes. This is a rough spot, too, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. The first few minutes always hurt the worst. Which 
excited about getting this tattoo because you know, I really love what it symbolizes, you know, good fortune, music, love. And um, I've never had a tattoo that I've regretted. I regretted the fact that the tattoo that this is covering up uh, had to be covered up because it was done so poorly. But I'll probably get that one redone on my back. The old tattoo, yeah. it'll hurt a little bit more there. I think it, with any human endeavor, um, the ritual is an important part of the process. So, sure, I love you know coming down to the tattoo shop and you know working with the tattoo artist and actually sitting down and getting the tattoo. I mean, it's, they wouldn't if they could just put it on your body with a a magic wand or something. I don't think it would be as meaningful. I just talked about it, I never said, let's do it. You know, I would say, if I'm gonna get it, I would do that. So when I, you know, came to Heather and said, hey, I wanna do that, and uh, she was just really excited. Ray was talking about the jar of mayonnaise for years, and I think it's the coolest thing ever. <laughs> it's a little scabby from, I just got it worked on a few days ago, but it's great. I love my bow, my safety seal. It's perfect. At first, I was shocked at how angry people were. Like, uh, you know, it's a very religious decision, apparently, you know, of what you put on your sandwich, you know, and they're like, I like Miracle Whip. You know, it's just not, hi, how are you? Or wow, or I like Miracle Whip. Or, you know, it's, it's amazing how people, uh, yeah, they just pick a side, you know. Three days after I got the tattoo, like I was walking to the bathroom and I passed a mirror and I saw the tattoo and I was like, oh my God, you know, it's so big. <laughs> and, uh, and instantly I went, man, I can never ever say that again. I mean, it's my tattoo and it's me. And, and you know, I never really regret it. It was just kind of a shocker. <laughs>weight boxing. It's boxing for more kind of like the regular guy that is looking to get into shape, but it's not necessarily looking to go to the gold gloves. Sort of a fun way to compete, do something a little bit different, and a great way to express yourself in a generally safe arena. I talked to my friend Peter up in Chicago. He had been boxing out of Windy City Gym, and I'd sparred with him a little when he came to town, and we'd both been boxing for probably about five years at that point. And I told him, let's say, hey, let's box for our friends, see what it's like. And I found a yard that we could have it at, my friend Patrick, and we decided to go ahead and have a boxing match on Memorial Day weekend. And we wound up going three rounds, and probably about, about 50 people, I guess, showed up, and. You know, we're knocking each other down, getting each other bloody, and having a good time, and I, I think it went pretty well. And then from there, we went to my own backyard, and we kind of made a makeshift ring, and we had a couple of fights on that card. Pablo, the Jab and Jew, fought uh, Dave Stokes, and I fought Peter again for a rematch, and people were getting such a great kick out of it, and they really enjoyed it. I thought it brought people together. Then we went from there to more backyards, and then we stepped up to uh, City Museum for a couple of fights in South Broadway, and now we're gonna, the next fights are gonna be over at uh, an old police station called Mad Art, and we keep changing it, making it bigger, and evolving, and it's been a lot of fun. It's been so much fun. When we go into the ring, we're fighting. We're boxing. We are hitting each other hard. We're trying to beat the other man or woman. Uh, we're hitting them as hard as we can. We're trying to keep our own balance and try to keep going. And it's not easy, but that's also life itself. I think Hoosier Weight Boxing has sort of tapped into uh, sort of a communal spirit, and it's brought, uh, again, a sport that a lot of people witnessed from afar and made it literally very close to them, and people they know, uh, in environments they feel comfortable seeing the sport in. So I think we've brought it out of, again, sort of a shadowy world and into a, a different shadowy world, maybe a, a different sort of fun world that people can kind of appreciate. 
I think it's great that somebody that didn't have any kind of formal background in, in throwing sporting events or, or boxing at all would, would start something up and get all kinds of people involved in it throughout the community that are involved in music and art and you know restaurants, bartenders, you name it. So it's a nice mix of people. I'm really glad that I got to be a part of it. I never thought that I would be in a ring boxing anyone, but here I am, so anything's possible. I've heard of my opponent. I scoped her out a couple of nights ago. Uh, she looks pretty tough. I've heard she's tough. Uh, we'll see what happens in the ring. Be afraid, because I'm coming for you. Well, okay, so Dana McDonough got scared, backed out. Steve found me another opponent, Rose Martelli. Again, she must have heard how hard I was hitting girls and uh, got scared and backed out. So I'm undisputed. I love boxing as a sport, not only to do it, but to watch it. So hopefully there'll be some blood, some sweat, some tears. Somebody's going to walk away a winner. Too bad it can't be me, though. <laughs> I'm going to buy Mama a new pair of shoes. I think it's the first uh, uh, boxing show inside an art gallery and police station. This is the female Hoosierweight Championship belt, and this is how it works. everybody else down. Do you have your book up there? Okay. Make sure you get his book up there right now. Make sure that Justin gets his physical. Too many people just kind of sit back and bemoan of what they don't have or what they want to do or what they could have done and I don't want to ever have to be in that position. Um, I might not be doing this for the rest of my life but I'm doing it and I will at least have done it and I'm so happy that I've had this opportunity. All of us were creating this opportunity for ourselves to make this happen. It's, it's kind of cool. It's really fun. I never really thought about the meaning of life, but I think a lot about how I want to live my life. And the one thing I do know I want to do with my life is I want to do the things that I enjoy doing. I, I want to be a lot more clear about spending time in my life doing the things that I enjoy, that give me pleasure. And also, on the other hand, the, the supplement to that is I want to make sure as a human being that I'm kind to other people. Life to me is about, number one, enjoying your work, enjoying what you do. and. Secondly, doing what you do well enough to make a living at it. And thirdly, to make a living at it in order to provide for your heirs. And at the same time, doing those three things while hurting nobody else and hopefully helping other people fulfill their goals. Doing whatever it is that makes you happiest without hurting anyone in the process. That's my meaning of life. Just stay busy and don't be mean. <laughs> I guess what I found out is that I'm part of a whole community of people who will do whatever they can to do what they love, and who will entertain, amuse, enlighten, and sometimes even inspire others along the way. So did I find my meaning of life? Well, I definitely stayed busy. I think that the meaning can be found in the search. The path itself is the answer, not necessarily the destination. Where is that destination? You won't know until you get there, will you?